On this week's Motor Week, I'm in the latest MPV from Citroen, the Picasso. Chris Goffey drives the all-new Seat Cordoba, and we have an exclusive from Ken Gibson on the PT Cruiser. There's an old saying, small is beautiful. And as far as car buyers are concerned, that certainly seems to be the case. Small car sales now account for around 25% of all vehicles sold in Britain. That's over half a million cars. And Toyota want to grab a share of that action with this, the Yaris 1.3 SR. The European Car of the Year has been transformed with the arrival of a 1.3-litre 16-valve engine that packs a real punch and has transformed the Yaris into a little pocket rocket. And it isn't just a new engine that sets the SR apart. There have been subtle changes to the styling. The Yaris still towers above its rivals on the road, but now has a rear roof spoiler and is colour-coded to match the owner's choice from the five colours available. The suspension has been lowered to give it a more dynamic and aggressive stance and a titanium effect grille helps to distinguish the SR from the other Yaris models. The whole look is finished off with 15-inch alloy wheels that come fitted as standard with Pirelli low-profile tyres. All very sporty. Once inside, you'll realise why so many comparisons have been made between the Yaris and the TARDIS. It's nice and compact on the outside, but it's absolutely huge inside. There's plenty of room for four adults, and there's even a decent amount of headroom. And you get a very sensible split-folding rear seat. It's all very practical. Here in the front, you'll find that the Yaris lacks the bland, boring interior that we normally associate with Japanese cars. OK, it is grey, but it's very well designed and at least it looks interesting. This sort of instrument panel in the middle is a fantastic idea. Everything is well laid out and it's very solid. And the little pod up here that houses the digital display, well, it might not be to everybody's taste, but I like it. The only thing to bear in mind is it can be a bit of a pain to read on a bright, sunny day. But as I live in Manchester, that's not going to be a problem for me now, is it? The new 1.3 engine has many similarities to the 1 litre unit, which was recently judged the International Engine of the Year. The main shared feature between that engine and this 1.3 is the use of Toyota's VVTi technology. This intelligent variable valve timing system is usually associated with larger luxury or sports cars, and it's used to great effect in the Yaris. In fact, once you get behind the wheel, it's a surprise just how quick the 1.3 engine really does feel. It may only produce 86 brake horsepower, but it is very punchy, particularly when you get it up into the mid-range. Zipping around town in it is no problem at all, not least because you've got plenty of power to hand when you want it, but also because of the fact that the steering is very responsive and light, and it's a very easy car to manoeuvre. Visibility is good, add to that a slick five-speed gearbox, and you've got a perfect little city car. Your next surprise comes when you get the Yaris out on the open road. The drive now feels far more refined and relaxed. The extra power from the new engine means that you no longer have to labour with the gears on a long incline. And this improved performance, together with changes to the suspension, means that the Yaris is now a far more entertaining drive all round. Coming in at just under 11 grand, the Yaris SR is a cracking little car and it proves that small is definitely beautiful, but it's also rather desirable as well. Citroen have bitten the bullet, taken the plunge and decided to enter the most hotly contested sector of the car market today, the mini MPV sector. So what wild and leery critter have they chosen to do it with? Well, this. The Picasso. Hello. Yes, it doesn't exactly look wild and crazy, does it? More sort of amiably dopey. This is an extremely important car for Citroen. They have had a rather bumpy ride financially of recent years, so they've had to put out some, well, pretty boring product, if we're honest. The Picasso marks the start of an entirely new range, and it puts Citroen right back where they were as one of the most innovative manufacturers around. The thing is, despite Citroen's open declaration of war, there's no need for all the hostility. Because what happens is that as the mini MPV sector is more or less entirely new, every time a manufacturer launches a new car in that sector, it expands. So it doesn't so much steal sales from the others as create new sales. 
Mind you, Citroen reckoned that in France, where this has already gone on sale, it is stealing sales from the likes of Fiat Multipla, Renault Scenic and Zafira. If there's one thing that all Mini MPVs have in common, it's that they're trying to kid you and me that they can do the impossible. They're trying to tell us that they're actually bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. But in the case of the Picasso, it probably gets closer to that than any other in the sector. Because looking at it from the outside, it looks like it's going to be small and cramped compared to Zafira, Multipla, etc. Get inside. And well, it feels, if anything, like a full-size MPV. You see, Citroen are making no bones about the fact that they have a big advantage here. By being last, if you like, to join the race, they can nick ideas. And boy, have they. At the front, the idea of having a kind of centralised dash and this gear lever raised up here to clear space through the cabin, straight from the Fiat Multipla. Forget at the back, we've got three individual rear seats. They've not gone for seven because the only seven-seater Zafira isn't selling very well. Stick with five, that's what the market wants. Then we've got down here a little storage bin set into the floor for keeping stuff in. Well, he was looking at me funny. That's Nick straight from the Renault Scenic. And then at the back... Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. We have some serious boot space. It is enormous in here. Nice, clean and straight. Now, if boots bore you, you won't be buying one. But if you care at all about getting the same amount of kit in as you've got people, you need a big boot. And you get one of these. You've not seen one of these before. Ah, it's uh, kind of a unique feature on a car. Ah, ah. It's a turbo space age granny trolley. But it's not all about nicking ideas. There is some original thought here too, which you would expect from Citroen. They were the original, original thinkers, if you see what I mean. We've got a full length sliding sunroof, which means you've got practically a convertible on a sunny day which this isn't. And then there's the ride, which is excellent. Soft and comfy enough to make long journeys a pleasure without sacrificing drivability to become a big saggy old blancmange. The Picasso is going to be available with a 1.6 and a 1.8 litre petrol engine, but I wouldn't even think about it. Face it, you've already taken the decision not to buy a sports car, so be sensible. Get the diesel. In this case, it's a 2 litre HDI. It's their common rail diesel. And in this, it is nothing short of superb. The power comes straight away from zero revs. You just launch yourself away. It's easy and flexible to drive and actually really quite quick. It's very much to Citroen's credit that they're being so honest about nicking ideas from everybody else. And it's to your and my benefit because the result is a winner. And there's more good news when it comes to pricing. It starts at 13,600, rises to about 15,700 pounds, up to a thousand pounds cheaper than some of the opposition. And as for that big competition between this and its French rival, the Renault Scenic, the first one to arrive on the mini MPV scene. Well, the pricing is about matched, but this gets an awful lot of extra kit and it gets all the best bits of the others. So like I say, a winner. After the break, we go to the gambling capital of the world, Las Vegas, for the first drive of the PT Cruiser. How do you go about making your cars different if you're a relatively small division of a huge multinational giant and you must use the floor pans, the engines and the transmissions from the mother factory? Well, if you're the Spanish SEAT manufacturer, you concentrate on trying to make your cars more youthful, more sporty and more colourful than the boring old Volkswagens they're based on. Now this is the Seat Cordoba Cupra 20VT. It's basically the Volkswagen Polo chassis, the ubiquitous 1.8 turbo engine, developing 150 brake horsepower. But Seat designers have contrived to give the car its own individuality and personality.
The Volkswagen electronic parts bin has been raided for various traction control and anti-lock brake systems, and they all contribute to the active safety of this agile little car. But if the worst comes to the worst, well, you've got airbags and side airbags for both the driver and passenger. Volkswagen may have allowed the Seat designers free hand in the shape of the car, but they're not going to let them get away with sacrificing anything in terms of rigidity and overall crash performance. As you'd expect, it handles very well. It's four square on the road. It's very easy to place to the inch when you're pressing on. Brakes are reassuring. It doesn't roll and it really sticks like glue to these dry Spanish roads. Of course, the combination of 150 brake horsepower in the relatively lightweight body shell of this car means performance. Performance that equates to that of the World Rally Championship Ibiza, which won the two litre class in 1996, 97 and 98 consecutively. In fact, it's that rally performance that has helped to transform the image of Seat from an assembler of old Fiat's initially and subsequently old Volkswagen's to a company at the forefront of the hot hatch market. Because make no mistake, this is a seriously quick car. Maximum speed of around 134 miles an hour and 0 to 60 in under 8 seconds means you've got to concentrate very hard if you're going to hang on to that clean driving license. Steering, light and positive, nice gear change and all the pedals are well weighted. And it's not all about rorty, zippy performance. This little car is just at home in the streets of a a medieval Spanish town as it is on the open road. That's not to say, of course, that it's too fast for this relatively humble chassis. Stiff anti-roll bars front and back, stiffer springs, big 16-inch alloy wheels with low-profile tyres and huge ventilated discs with four-pot calipers at the front ensure that things don't get out of hand. This car and its equivalent Ibiza sister go on sale in the UK in September this year. The price, well, Seat say it should be around £14,000. And for that money, they claim it's the most powerful car in its class. Now, it has to be said, the Rover 25 GTI at 143 brake horsepower runs it pretty close. But the great thing about these cars, despite all the flash and brio of the Spanish design, you've still got the strength of Volkswagen round you. Welcome to the Nevada desert, one of the hottest places anywhere. And this is the Chrysler PT Cruiser, the hottest car in the world. And over there is Las Vegas. Driving into Las Vegas is absolutely weird. It just appears out of nowhere in the middle of a desert. Despite its hot rod looks and a 2.4 litre engine for a relatively small car, certainly by American standards, do not expect hot car performance. The PT Cruiser lives up to its name. It is a cruising machine. It's whisper quiet coming into Vegas. We were doing just under 70 and this car is so silent. The only noise you can hear is the air con. And believe me, in Las Vegas, you need air con and plenty of it. It's got a very, very composed ride on the road. It's mega comfortable. Um, it seems to handle well. Out here in the desert and driving, I have to concede there aren't too many 
really tight bends where you can push it on but it seems to be very composed and I think it'll settle very well on English roads. The PT in Cruiser actually stands for personal transport, but it could just as easily stand for practical transport. We're told there are over 30 different seating variations, which turns the Cruiser into one of the most versatile vehicles on the road. There's no doubt the PT Cruiser is one real high roller, but it's time to head back to reality and sadly leave the madness of Las Vegas behind us. This is the new Audi A2, the world's first high-volume production car made entirely from this aluminium. It's also got a service module at the front, so you don't need to open the bonnet and get your hands dirty. It's bigger than an A3. So, anything more to tell you? Can't think of anything. But hang on a minute, there is some more. It's now nearly two years since Mercedes launched their A-Class onto the market, following one or two problems. Well, not wanting to be outdone, arch-rivals Audi now launched their small people carrier, with one important difference, the aluminium. It's only about two and a half years ago since this car was a concept at Frankfurt, and like the TT, the production version has stayed pretty much the same as the concept version. You couldn't honestly say it's got stunning looks to it, but I think the design probably grows on you. What you do know you're going to get, though, is top-class build quality and some sort of exclusivity, because Audi only intend to sell about 2,500 A2s every year in the UK. I think you know immediately when you step into a car, you sit in the driver's seat and you start to drive it, whether it's the right sort of car for you and how you feel about it. And this car, to me, feels extremely good. No doubt that it's put together extremely well. We've just seen an A-Class just go past on the other side. And really, to me, there's absolutely no comparison. The steering is nicely weighted, the clutch is nice and light, the gear shift is smooth and precise. All A2s will come as standard with Audi's stability control system, ESP, which you can switch off if you get up to 43 miles an hour. After that, it's on permanently to give you some helping assistance should you need it. Going around corners, there's a tendency, as ever with a car of this size and height, for it to roll a little. So, what engines are available in the A2 range? Well, only two, both 1.4 engines, a diesel and a petrol. The diesel is a three-cylinder TDI, producing 75 brake horsepower, fairly respectable acceleration time, 0 to 60 of about 12 seconds, and a top speed of about 110 miles an hour. But it's the fuel economy where you really notice, boy, will it sip juice, doing over 66 miles to the gallon on the combined route. Now, all cars these days are about having a unique selling proposition, and the Audi A2 is no different. Not only does it have a bonnet, which you can't really access the engine through, but it has this unique fold-down flap where you can get access to the things that you really need on a weekly basis, like the oil, the dipstick, and topping up the washer fluid. Build quality has become such an important factor these days, not only for car makers, but for we, the public. We want the solid, reassuring thud of a door. Dare it be said, at the moment, that's not what you get with the Mercedes A-Class. It just doesn't have a Merc feel to it, whereas the A2 has an Audi feel to it. And in my opinion, at the moment, nobody builds cars better than Audi. Lightweight construction is what this car is all about. Audi's space frame, first used in the superb A8, goes to the masses in the A2. An aluminium body contributes to over 40% weight saving compared to if this car had been made from steel. That's a weight of just 895 kilograms, compared to the A-Class, which comes in at nearly 1,100 kilograms. Dimensions indicate that the A2 is longer but narrower than the A-Class. And that extra length means more boot space back here. The A-Class has been criticised for not having enough. The A2 gets 390 litres of space like that, or 1,085 litres with those seats folded back down. And remember, 
this car is shorter than an A3. Inside on the move, the view from each of the seats is absolutely excellent. And what a lot of people buy these sorts of cars for, of course, is the high up driving position. And it just gives you such a commanding view of the road. As you can see, there's lots and lots of headroom, even for somebody like six foot tall like me. I guess the main rivals for the A2, well, of course, would be the Mercedes A-Class, but you've also got to look towards something like the Vauxhall Zafira, the Mazda Premacy, Fiat's Multipla, and Renault Scenic as the most direct rivals. So just who would buy this sort of car? I think people who will be interested in the A2 are people who don't want to sacrifice any of the quality that they would expect from an Audi, and the prestige elements of Audi, but also a car which is um, packaged in a more compact way than we have introduced a car in the past. So it's uh, very good space inside for the exterior dimensions. It makes it a very nimble car, um, fun to drive, um, and without compromising on comfort, security, safety and luxury. Final specification has yet to be decided for the UK cars, but expect to see electric windows, height adjustable seats, ABS brakes, alloy wheels, a standard... Audi's philosophy is always, I mean, Forschung durch Technik is looking for new ways of doing things, and I think this is another good example of not accepting that that's the way to build a car. So at the end of the day, aluminium like this normally wraps up turkey. But I think the A2 is anything but a turkey. So who exactly is going to buy this car? Well, Audi predicts sales of around 2,500 a year. So it's going to be a fairly rare sight on our roads. But who knows, with demand, that could soon go up. It goes on sale in September in the UK. Prices at the moment, well, we've heard about £15,000 as the starting price for a base model. But if prices shift during the summer, as they may well do, this could start as low as £13,000. There's no doubt that the A2 is a revolutionary car, and Mercedes-Benz with their rival, the A-Class, could be well and truly foiled. Next week on MotorWeek, Ginny Buckley gets her top off with the Honda S2000, and I get to grips with the fantastic TVR Tuscan.